and uh, feed water to me. Mercatifus uh, is a collector of berry and many other things. So I would love to start asking some questions by about uh, could you give us an overview um, of your art practice? Yeah, so about a decade ago, I did um, a project that dealt tangentially with the Holocaust. And when people saw it, people would look at it and say, we know the story. Maybe we don't know that lady in your video, but we know the story. And I would always think if we know that story so well, how do we explain repeating it again and again and again? And so I became very interested in our collective role as public witness to history. And what is our responsibility as witness and our failing as public witness, which in some way makes us complicit in the recurrence. So I started working on this project and it, it really deals with the, the, the idea of witness to trauma and specifically to genocide and the recurrence of genocide. So all the works for the last 10 years I've made have been these somewhat abstract landscapes but made from very precise, at very precise locations where acts of genocide happened. So in this show, we've got works from Rwanda and Bosnia. I've also worked in Poland, Ukraine, Namibia. But the Rwanda and um, Bosnia are particularly important because Rwanda was this extraordinary sort of trauma, I mean, human crisis, because we were basically having people who'd never killed before killing people. And a million people were killed in a hundred days, making it the fastest rate of killing in human history. And the world did nothing. We all sat back. And when it all came out, everyone said, if we'd have known, if we'd have known. A year later, we did the same thing in the middle of Europe, in Bosnia. And so to show these two projects, these two um, locations for me side by side, really talks in this like, stark sort of contrast to our absolute failing as as public witness. And so that's kind of what my practice is focused on for the last ten years. Sorry? For the yeah, yeah, yeah. Well this one I think is only Bosnia and, and Rwanda and I think that when you show those two together, it reminds us in, in a very pointed way of how the world failed. And if I may add, you know the just the position of the two, Rwanda and Bosnia, might seem um, a stretch because one imagines these places being so far away and culturally and geographically. Uh, but then in the world there are so many things that seem to happen at the same time for a particular reason. And just a couple of weeks ago at the UN, they passed a resolution to make July the 11th um, a world uh, uh, Day for the remembrance of the Srebrenica um, uh, massacre and genocide in, in Bosnia. And incidentally, that UN resolution was sponsored by uh, the US, France, and Rwanda, and Germany. But so the connection between Rwanda and Bosnia that Barry is making in this exhibition actually exists on so many other levels in our culture and in the world today. And, um, and seeing the words together here, it's actually quite poignant. So talking about these words and talking about your collection, a uh, little overview around your collection? My collection is very eclectic. Okay. Uh, having started as uh, working in galleries in contemporary arts and then as an art advisor as well for many uh, private and corporate collections, I've come across many different artists and works and throughout the years, I purchased and acquired work for many different reasons, but always a very personal attachment to the work, uh, a very, and, and all the, always, almost always, a, a very personal attachment to the artist. So what's the concept behind it? conceptual the, level? Definitely, the, the, I've been lucky enough to be able not only to appreciate the work on a wall, but also to um, meet and learn uh, from the artists that produce that work. And so if there is a thread in my collection, it's definitely that personal relationship between me and the artist via the work that then entered my collection. At the end of the day, um, the word collection is, and collector these days very much misused. 
Uh, not everybody that buys something becomes a collector, and not everybody, and not everything that is put together becomes a collection. So there are many ways to put together a collection, and it's really how you uh, also use it, and how you live with it, and how you present it to others uh, that makes it a thoughtful group of works. And everyone should use their own uh, their own interest uh, to make that interest. And so there's not really only one way to put together a collection per se. So that's how you fit Barry's work into your collection? Well, the way I fit it is because all of my works do have this personal collective connection between me, uh, the actual the, the, the physical work and the artist that produced it, but also because uh, uh, being married to an American diplomat and, and moving around the world uh, for the last 25 years, uh, my husband is the former U.S. ambassador to Bosnia and Herzegovina. We move uh, for, first and mostly we packed our our collection. So the first thing that arrives in the new residence when we move in a different country before the clothes, it's the art. <laughs> and we've been using very much, you know, our collection or our group of works uh, as very much as a starting point for uh, conversations. Well, you know, in our world we. Uh, end up having you know, having meeting and having to entertain uh, a variety of people that you never met before, uh, and sometimes also difficult guests, and sometimes awkward situations where uh, you might not be able to have a lot in common. But then, throughout the work of ours that are on the walls, you find ways to break through, and uh, and you know their conversation starters, but also. Wonderful to see that whatever you might think you don't have in common, once you start talking about a work of art, uh, the passion, the interest, and whatever you feel or see in it brings you together and finds a common ground. I just want to say when, when I hear people talk about the importance of art in his collection yeah. to facilitate conversation in his poem, it is so important because when I started dealing with the subject of the Holocaust and genocide. People would say to me, who's ever going to want to live with that? Who wants to bring that into the home? <laughs> and it's a very important issue because I think if, if we fail to bring that conversation into the home, we become complicit in the problem. So, so why is it okay to have that conversation in the institution, the school, the university, the classroom, but not at the dinner table? And I think if, 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 when we hold that back, in some way we start to become complicit in the problem. And so it was really important for me to make aesthetic works that people sort of respond to on an aesthetic level first, because that paves the way to do exactly what Philippe was saying. It paves the way to bring the conversation into the household, which for me is an incredibly, incredibly important reason that you make work that has a, 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 an element of advocacy. So, you know, come back to uh, you have this um, topic that you're talking about, uh, that we see on the very beautiful images here. How do you come to have this narrative around this and this aesthetics? So, so for me, obviously, the, the aesthetic is of primary importance. So that the idea is that the work is incredibly intensely researched. I, I spend a lot of time researching. I work with historians with genocide activists in these places, and I go to very precise locations where something specific happened, but I don't want to document the location as much as I want to comment on this idea of bearing witness. So I'll go to these locations, and then I'll start to move outwards within witness distance, but, but an artist definition of witness distance, so it can be you know, a liberal definition. The work behind me, nothing happened there, but that river, runs through a, a nearby Srebrenica. And so the river, the idea is that the river bore witness. So when the river empties into this lake, the idea still was the, the, the water as witness. So I used the, the term, I, I define the term quite liberally, specifically to try and get to a location where I can make an aesthetic picture. Because my thinking is, you know, if I can't engage someone on an aesthetic level, the opportunity to have a more substantial conversation is, is sort of gone. And I think the idea of sort of the aesthetic and the trauma creates this 
this tension because people look at it and say, wow, this is such a beautiful picture. What, tell me about it. And then I tell them what happened and they jaws <laughs> <laughs> a, a little bit. But I, I, I think the, for me, the aesthetic is really important. And we're so used to the dissemination of information on this subject being much more didactic. You know, it's through the lens of the historian, and the photojournalist, the documentarian. And that there's um, a lot of writing that, that very heavily influenced me by a Dutch academic called Ernst von Alphen. And what Ernst basically says is our ability to process fact-based information about trauma is saturated. You know, we, we just can't take it in anymore. We're so used to seeing these horrific images. And he issues a call to the artist. And he says it is the responsibility of the artist to try and engage the public um, more with the right brain, the, the, the part of the brain that, that interprets um, more it, it sort of intangible information, to engage the audience's information in more creative ways in order to try and move the public consciousness forward. And so the aesthetic is a critical, a critical component of the work. An abstraction has been the language of many artists to be able to uh, address um, a subject, a subject matter, or, or a controversial issue, or a personal issue, and bring it to the audience uh, in a different way that a journalist or a photojournalist might be able to do. And they're all valid uh, ex ways of expression, and the more, um, the, the more languages are used to discuss uh, an issue, uh, something that an artist is passionate about, uh, the better the audience can participate. Uh, and it's, it's, since, since post-war abstraction is, is, it's been what has helped uh, audiences uh, confront uh, issues that would have been much more difficult to confront if only um, to engage with uh, writing uh, or with journalism. And, and the role of artist is exactly that, is to provide uh, a more personal and also more um, individual way to, uh, to get into a subject. And, and Barry's work, the format and the way they're printed, uh, not only the composition, but the way the actual is presented, they're very much um, in, in inviting you in, they sort of draw you in, in, this, uh, in this haze. Um, something that you might be able to get uh, if a good writer writes an incredible piece of literature or a book, uh, and but some people might not be able to do that um, in the abstraction of their minds, but they can do it with the uh, visual aid uh, of a photograph and start a journey. And each work of art is successful if it engages the, the, the audience, uh, and, and that's what attracts me. And, Barry's work in my collection is exactly that, that it engages immediately, you are drawn into these, uh, these landscapes, and then it's about, it's, it's your journey, and it's how much you want to find out, and how much you want to learn, and the questions you want to, to ask yourself, and, uh, and, and learn from it, and discuss it, it's, uh, it's, it's a great sort of portal, uh, but then again, like with every work of art, it's up to you to want to take the journey. This is just the ticket. Can I tell a little secret about my, 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 my strategies? Um, so I, I, when Filippo said the reason he was attracted to it is it, it's work that like, draws you in. When I started working with this idea of motion and, and landscape, I was working very much with sort of left to right, like through a moving vehicle. And it was it, it failed for me because what happens when you work left to right is that you give the eye permission to enter the image here, to walk through, and to leave. And I wasn't, I felt like I wasn't staying in, in the landscape as much. And so I started experimenting with working vertically. And you'll see in all of these images that the, the motion of the camera is vertical. And for me, and I hope it sort of translates into to the way people respond, but for me, when I'm working vertically, if I look at that, image, I don't go out of it. And I, I stay in, in the work. I can place myself in the landscape. I don't 
my eye doesn't travel out of it. I stay present in the image for longer. And for me, that became a really important uh, realization as I was sort of exploring how I dealt with the subject. So, rather than me, can you tell us something about this? Yeah, so, so, so people often um, either ask me or just assume that the works are double exposures or triple exposures, and I'm compositing them because you can see, for example, in, in, in um, Defiant Blues, there are parts of the image that are incredibly sharp and there are parts that are, are blurred. Um, but for me, it, it, it was very important that I make the work in a single exposure in camera, that there's no compositing, because my work really talks about this idea of the ethics of seeing, you know, what is our ethical responsibility of bearing witness. And for me to do that with authenticity, I felt like I had to make the image in, in a single exposure as the lens, as the metaphor for the eye, as the lens sees it. But I didn't want to start faking the mm -hmm. image. Mm -hmm. so, so, what, so what I do is each image is made in a single exposure in the camera. Um, and I typically will start with the camera on the tripod for part of the exposure, and they're all quite long exposures. And just before the lens closes, I'll move the camera up or down or left to right. And that's what creates this sort of blur in some parts of the image and the sharpness in others. But it became really important for me to have that rule for myself, that, that, that I had to be able to create it in one exposure. Of course. Just a little step back. In your writing, you talk about the idea of using the landscape, the landscape, sorry, for uh, in uh, your work. Um, <laughs> So when I was in art school, the, the introductory day, the head of the, the program said to us, you know, to make work that, that people are going to engage with, you have to come up with something new to say. He said, but if you're not smart enough to come up with something new to say, come up with a new way to tell people about something they think, that they, they think that they know. And, you know, when I sort of was challenging myself when people had said to me, we know the story about the Holocaust. Like, how do you come up with a new way to engage people with subject matter they think they know? And I had studied a Dutch painter by the name of Armando, and he does these very beautiful landscapes of forests, but he coined the term the guilty forest. Mm -hmm. And he also deals with sort of the memory of World War II and, and, and so on. And his idea of the guilty forest was that the trees of the forest were guilty because they saw everything. And he even goes further to say the trees on the outskirts of the forest are more guilty than the trees in the middle because on the outside the trees witness more. And so I started thinking a lot about that and I, start, I loved the idea of this metaphor of the, 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 the tree is, or the forest is witness. And I started building it and, and developing it. And it's actually a very beautiful metaphor because if you think about it, the landscape witnesses everything. Like us, it sees everything. And like us, it does nothing. And in fact, it's worse than it does nothing. It becomes complicit in the cover-up because the trees shed their leaves, they cover up the evidence. But in a very beautiful way, the landscape also rejuvenates. You know, it, re it restores, it recovers, it replenishes. And so when you take that metaphor to a sort of conclusion, I think the landscape also offers this, this hope for a more humane tomorrow. And so for me, it just became the, the foundation of how I explore the, the subject. Wonderful people. Um, that's kind of the commercial side of, of this. So we, these are editions of eight. eight. So I think but this can be just this is really well. Yeah, this is so, this triptych is eight of eight, that's the last one. I think these are the last ones left. I um, don't have can we that's <laughs> that's right. Right. Well, this would be the time to fix <laughs> that. That's that's the thing that I should add this triptych to my collection. That would be fantastic, but I already got my eye on it, so. <laughs> Uh, no, no, that's not the point. It's my fear. It's <laughs> 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 the the, the national side is, is interesting because artists don't usually like to talk. Exactly, so, so I'm not asking you. But the good, the good thing about talking to a collector, that obviously a collector has to um, 
consider that because it's uh, not about what you want, but also what you can afford sometimes. Uh, and so you make decisions on uh, uh, what are your priorities and you make your sacrifices because you really want something. And uh, so, uh, of course, the if, you know, as a collector, you also look uh, very much at the artist's production, not just uh, the work itself or the image itself. You also uh, look at how the, the artist um, presents it physically, uh, how it's printed and uh, how it's um, conceived and framed because it's very much part of the work itself. I find it very important uh, when I buy a work of art, uh, the actual presentation from how it's printed, mounted and framed, it's very much part of it. I don't necessarily like when uh, uh, artists give me too much freedom in uh, framing something. Uh, because <laughs> that's a barrier that some people have. That, you know, that some, you know, some painting is a big gilded frame, so it has a complete different uh, feel than the same work of art in a complete different presentation. So I do like when artists sort of uh, uh, pass on to you something that is finished. Yeah. Uh, and then the role of a collector is to sort of take it home and give it a new life. It's like adopting a baby. Uh, <laughs> but the baby has to be fully clothed. Yeah. <laughs> and then I can take it in my, uh, in my home and make it you know, interact with my other uh, children. And then they have a life of their own and they have conversations of their own. Um, but I don't like to add to the actual work my own physical um, um, detail. So I like what, uh, how Barry presents his work because it's very much conceived to enhance exactly what his composition and his work is supposed to be. The, the, the special paper that he uses, the way it's mounted on aluminium and the specific um, simple white uh, frame you know, mount, that is very important to the work. The minute you start presenting printing it in a different size or a different kind of paper or a different kind, then of course it has a different uh, look and it will engage differently. So I, I like when artists actually give as much consideration to the to the final presentation of the work as much as the, conceive, the, the, the conception of the work. And then, as you wanted me to comment for, on, the, on the editions, uh, editions are also one. very important because photography is a multiple and uh, you know, like printmaking. Uh, uh, and uh, and rightly so, uh, photographers have, a, have a, um, uh, uh, an option to decide a number of uh, how many of the same work you want to see. And I do like uh, how Barry, uh, for example, has a very, very limited and uh, focused way of uh, editioning his work. Uh, I like when uh, um, artists like Barry don't make works to measure. So that the same work might exist in three different sizes, uh, and three different frames, and three different sort of like you know, tailor made to what's your budget or what's your space. Uh, as I said, the size is to me intrinsic to the work. If he has decided that this is the size, that means that this is the size that works for this particular work. Uh, you know, in a different production, he might decide that he would print them completely different. So it's important with photography to, uh, to also consider that as part of the work. And then how many, of course, I like when there are not many in the edition. As a collector, you want to, to feel that you have something that not everybody else also has. Uh, but as, uh, and I collect a lot of contemporary photography, editioning is part of that. And sort of being able to share that as well, for me, it's not a problem, it's actually a plus. Uh, and uh, uh, and then when you said you know this trip to here for example it's only available as number eight of eight. It's the last one. one. Um, I don't know. I, I I I never comment on why is one more popular than others. Uh, I I usually tend to pick the ones that have not sold as many as others. Uh, so I think it's it, the beauty of, of of buying art is that if you um, you can really follow your your interest. Uh, a lot of people seem to be ex drawn towards the images that have already sold before, yeah, but they the feel, they feel, yeah, they feel yeah, like, yeah, yeah, so probably they feel a little bit more something. secure if other collectors of other museums have bought this triptych, then I should get that. 
Uh, I don't have that insecurity. <laughs> but I'm very happy when uh, a museum or another collector buys the picture that I bought at the next edition. You buy first. Right? Same. same. I, got, I got the same thing. Hey, what do you think this works? Um, so I'm, I'm done, it's done so well. particularly attached to, to, to this triptych because for me it's one artwork that tells my entire story. You know, it, it, it talks about this idea of, you know, um, from, from kind of steady state to some turmoil to this complete blurring, like the full sort of chaos. And, and in, in one work, that's really sort of what the essence of my practice is about. But what I love about it is how different people interpret it. It gives us room. I've had a lot of people say, shouldn't this one go here and, and that one go there? And my point is, it doesn't matter. I think the importance of it is that it can function in multiple ways. And then people have said to me, well, you know, what happens when you get here? What's the next one in the series look like? And people have said different things. Does it go back to that? Is it a complete white space or complete black space? And so at once, this work is quite didactic. It's, it's like sequence, one, two, three. But it also leaves this. Um, this opening, this place for the viewer to interpret it in, in, in its own way, so in their own way. So that's, for me, that's why I think, you know, it's, um, people have responded particularly well to it. I understand. People. Uh, what do you think the role Barry's work in a collection, uh, specifically the specifically work that carries this important meaning, uh, rest of that, uh, work that has pure aesthetic appeal. It is important that the collector understands the work re for real or is just... Well, one would hope that somebody decides to take something home that they have engaged with previously, okay. but um, everyone has a different way of surrounding themselves with art, uh, so I don't think there is just one right way. Uh, the beauty of works like Barry's that, that bear a very poignant and complicated and difficult message but at the same time are visually uh, pleasing because of the abstraction that is included in the making. The beauty of that is that it really allows people to react as fast or as slowly to the message. So how they leave the world of a gallery That's something the artist can't control all the time. Uh, but somehow it's like letting a child you know, go and, uh, and, and be, be a grown-up. And uh, if the work is strong, it will carry its values and its meanings everywhere it goes. If the work is only strong in a gallery together with other works, then the danger is that when it's on its own somewhere else, surrounded by other things, it sort of loses its power. Uh, so, as a collector, I always try to buy something that um, can stand on its own. Uh, and when I go and see a, a solo exhibition, there are a lot of works that I might fall in love with, but then I feel that they need the help of what's oh next God. to them, or in the yeah. same room, and I always think even if this is not my favorite picture in the show, which one would be the one that carries the entire weight of the show when I take it home, in my home, with my other... So everyone has to make that, that leap uh, and see how that work will then work for them, with them, and with whatever else that they like to, to associate it with. And everyone would come up with a different decision. Um, Sometimes I bought works that were not my first choice as soon as we showed that I did this, made a specific uh, decision to buy that one because that one was going to be strong enough on its own. And that is a, something that people not necessarily think first when purchasing works of art in a gallery. Uh, but it's important to sort of block 
your vision from everything else when making a decision on one work and we really start thinking, is this strong enough for me or does this have everything I want when I take it away with me? And you'd be surprised, sometimes you change your mind and go for something else that you initially no, thought. I do not. I've just done it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. um, your work has like, a very deep uh, meaning and understanding and, and being intent. How do you get this information across uh, when somebody gets and buys your work? You know, it's, it's a, I think for artists, it's always a tough decision about how much of your, your thinking do you communicate to the audience and how much of it to just let, let the audience figure out sort of um, what they want. For me, it, it's, I almost feel like post-digital, like with analog photography, the artist handled the print, the hand of the artist was on it, and so the, the technique and the craftsmanship was very important. I feel like, and this is just my, my madness, but I feel like since digital photography the importance of the conceptual thinking behind the work became even more important. And I had read somewhere, I don't remember who the writer was, but she said something along the lines of the role of the photographer today is really what the role of the philosopher had been like in earlier sort of his, his art historical moments. Um, and so for me, the thinking behind it is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, but if people just respond to it on an aesthetic basis, I'm completely fine with that. You know, I, I'm, I'm okay. completely, completely fine with it. Um, you'll notice that other than a very short text on the window, um, the only other information that we really give about the works is um, the location. So at some point, say, there's an artist who deals with Srebrenica, who deals with Rwanda, who deals with Ukraine. Like if you're thinking enough about it, you start to join join the dots. And then also the other thing is like, what's he trying to say with this blurring? You know, it's like it's pretty, but but you know, if you if you know a little bit about art, oftentimes at art school they would just tell you the first question you ask yourself is, what's the intent of the artist? And what's the artist, even if you're not listening to the artist speak, you look at it like, why is he doing that? What's the intent? He's shot this work in Rwanda. There's this blurring thing going on. Why? And for me, that's enough. That's that. If that's as far as you go, that's enough. And it is super important, I think, for me to leave space for the viewer to interpret the work in their own way. I like, had an incredibly touching experience when when Divine Blooms, that work was first um, exhibited. Uh, the woman who bought it came up to me and said, "I just fell in love with that work, and she was all teary." She said it was so powerful for me because it's my story. And when I shot it, and I met, called it the, the, the title of it Defiant Blooms, it was sort of the idea of survival in the darkness. You know, these like little weeds had sort of overcome the darkness and continued to find defiant. They had, they, you know, had survived. And she told me that she was a, she had survived, just recently survived a brain tumor. And for her, she was the little yellow flowers. Mm -hmm. Those flowers were her story of survival. And I was so, so touched by that because for me that meant my artwork was working. She had made the story her story, mm -hmm. which is so much more important than she appreciating it because of my story. So I think when, when an when a, a audience member or a viewer can put themselves in the work, if I need enough space for that, then I feel like I'm doing my job as an artist. So I if I may up. add, genocide deniers are all about disputing facts and numbers and dates. And um, this work is not about facts and numbers and dates. This work is about making you um, address this traumatic experience and events that we collectively carry our past and present through an emotional and personal way that does not get distracted by the, uh, the disputed 
number of victims or dates or responsibilities and this is bigger than that and this is also a way to fight genocide deniers you're not engaging in that simplistic way of uh, taking a tragedy like a genocide and sort of disputed it on a table because you're disputing minutia. Uh, this is undeniable uh, and allows people to really consider it, feel it, and believe it uh, without sort of um, trying to undermine the historical uh, fact that it has happened. Just for sure. I would like to ask you to ask a question. <laughs> question. Come on, Stuart. Yeah, Take yeah. a break, a second, we'll call on and, Stuart and ask a very ask smart, it. insightful <laughs> question. No, it's been very educational. Thank you. That's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> we want to move to the stage. No, it's, uh, as I said, it's fascinating to because I have come across your work when I'm up in Cape Town, but never really understood it. Uh, is there in your practice, Barry, uh, there are cases when a person, a collectioner, uh, didn't want to buy your works uh, uh, when he knew the story behind? Because he didn't want to have some uh, sort of tragedy and uh, his or her place. Um, yes, it's happened a lot. Um, and I'm okay with that. Because I would rather you have like a visceral, like super strong feeling that I'm, I'm responding to this almost so much that it's, it's too intense for me to, to take it. So I'm okay with that. Um, I've had other experiences where a collector bought a, a work from Poland and she said every time she walked past it, she would tear up. But she still lived with it, you know, and I think um, sort of either way. For me, the most important thing, because it really work that deals with advocacy. The most important issue is I want you to feel something. And if that means you choose not to live with it, I'm completely okay with that. You know, otherwise I mean when? Yeah, yeah, otherwise I would spend my time, you know, shooting beautiful sunsets of the ocean. You know, it's more important that I get a message across and if it's too much for you to live with, I know I've really touched you. You know, this one, um, a collector um, was super close to buying it, but you can see in the the, the corner here, there's some building. It's actually an unfinished hotel. It was a new hotel. I mean, these works were made 24 years after the genocide. But to the person, when he looked at that, it looked like these sort of falling apart houses, what might be left after the genocide to draw. And he decided not to buy the triptych. And this was a very sophisticated collector because that felt to him like sort of the, the, the isolated, the desolate, the destruction. And I was fine with that. I mean, I, I want, if you feel it intensely, um, that's for me, you know, the most important job. It may not be good enough for the gallerist, but it's certainly good, good enough. For gallerists, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want to answer that question? Any of us? I'm very, I'd like to make a comment, you know, when I went to Kenya, Years ago, I traveled all over Africa as part of my livelihood. I was being taken around by a woman uh, to go and taste the tribal food. Um, and my image of Kenya started like that, talking to her. So for me, this is a this is a spiritual thing for me. Mm. In the conversation with her, her story came out that she lived alone with a little child and a housewife, and they had been displaced. There was a genocide that happened there, I think it took just a few days, 10 days or something, because uh, these two tribes that rose up against each other, they had never killed each other. She was living in the home with uh, her husband, who was from the other tribe, and they always lived peacefully together. She had to get into the back of a truck uh, after just having uh, had this baby and flee for her life, with her son's life. And I found myself there. Mm. And the thing that is, so interesting around the facts coming into our lives is they all look like that. 
But when you take them into your psyche and you, you, met, you, you, you consider them, they mean to actually open you up. It's like an action, uh, an act of prayer. Um, so for me, when I look at that, that's very prayerful. And I love the way that your eye goes left to right. It starts with that, it goes there, and that's where you should be. It's not a clear space why humans go into this, this arena of doing something like this. It's so foreign, that it's so present in each of us, mm-hmm. that it's something to, to contemplate. And I think you, you address it so beautifully, particularly in the triptych. Um, so, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.